So uh, thanks for having me here, um, Isabel and Eve, and the whole NPMS board. So um, I will talk on our analysis of antibodies of their FC glycans by mass spec. And uh, we, I think we started on this kind of 10 months ago, really getting samples here from the LUMC, but also from the Amsterdam Medical Center and looking at antibody responses against the virus and specifically at the glycans on these antibodies. Um, I will start introducing antibody glycosylation and also asking the question, why would you bother about glycans on these uh, antibodies? And here you see a schematic representation of a IgG1 antibody with a CH2 domain. And on this domain, you have a tiny small glycan. So this is not in proportion. The glycan is way smaller, but it, it influences the structure of this CH2 domain and also the interaction with various receptors. And I want, like, I want to stress that you have a variety of glycans on human antibodies as indicated here. So they are quite diverse in structure. So these end glycans, how do they look like? That's indicated here. So we have complex type glycans, which have various antennae. That's these outer parts, which can have a galactose, a yellow circle. They can have salic acids, which are these purple diamonds. And uh, you can have a coffee cause. That's going to be the most important sugar here to discuss. So a rather small sugar mass increment is then 146 Dalton. And that one can be present, yes or no, on these antibodies. And here I want to indicate why this uh, matters, whether your antibody which you make has this fucose, yes or no. And we worked on this with Gesto Widerson and his uh, group from the Sanquin, from the blood bank in Amsterdam. So what they made is they took the effort of producing antibodies with all these different variants of glycosylation. So some of the antibodies uh, had fucose present, indicated by this um, red bar, and others were lacking the fucose as indicated here. And, and then the, the assay they did was a simple receptor binding assay. Um, for the 3A receptor, which is on immune cells and which is responsible for activating these immune cells. And uh, what you can see is antibodies with a few on are switched off. So they don't bind to this receptor or hardly bind, while the antibodies lacking the few are switched on and show a strong binding to the receptor. Um, here you have the key for the other sugars. In blue, we have the n glucosamine. And now this is all data from literature, uh, which indicates the molecular basis on why this glycosylation matters. What we see here is a crystal structure and we have on the left hand side, if we zoom in, in the antibody and here we have this receptor, the 3A receptor, which is present on various immune cells on NK cells, macrophages and uh, neutrophils. Um, so this receptor three, IgG receptor three, um, is shown here, it also happens to be, be glycosylated. And at the interface of the receptor and the antibody, we see that these glycans meet, at least they do in case the fucose is not present. We have quite some productive hydrogen bonds here. Whilst when the fucose is present, that's indicated here in this variant, then it acts as a steric hindrance and uh, blocks quite some uh, hydrogen bonding from being formed. And that means the affinity is dropping by roughly a factor of 20 or 50. Um, now, we know that this matters for uh, fighting uh, cancer, for having an anti-tumor immune response, which, uh, which would be antibody mediated. And uh, here we see assays with two therapeutic antibodies. One is Herceptin, which is used in a simple in vitro assay with immune cells and then a cancer cell line. And the antibody is here produced in two variants without this fucose, so a switched on and with a few cores present switched off. And we see indeed that uh, only the variant of the antibody lacking the few cores is an efficient killer of the cancer cell, while the one with the few cores is very inefficient in killing the cancer cell. And this is if you wanna have a picture on how this could look like, you have the cancer cell, which is has some antigen that is a server, the HER2 surface, the HER2 antigen, we have the antibody binding, and then here we have the FC gamma receptor 3A on the immune cell, which could be an NK cell. And we 
by, by this interaction, the immune cell gets activated and starts killing the cancer cell. Now, before I move to the COVID uh, analyses, I want to share two slides from uh, Stefan Lippold from our group. So he has now set up a method to probe this receptor antibody interaction uh, in a column in an LCMS setup. So what do we do in terms of separation? We have an affinity separation. We have the receptor domain on the, on the stationary phase. We uh, flush over the antibody and then antibodies will bind to the, to the receptor. And then we start stressing the interaction by a pH gradient. And by shifting towards lower pH, we start eluting then uh, antibodies, first the, the low affinity ones, so the low binders, and then the high binders will come off later. And as I said, we use mass spec as a detector that's shown here doing native mass spec detection. Uh, we have here the charge envelope. Um, if we de deconvolute, we see all these glycovariants. So in the previous slide, these glycovariants were produced um, recombinantly and uh, were probed one by one. And here we have kind of a multiplexed assay. We apply the whole mixture of glycoforms to the <clears throat> receptor. We measure the interaction and we look at their illusion upon uh, pH stress. That's shown here. So this is the whole repertoire of antibodies with different lichens on the two heavy chains. Those are applied if we only uh, apply UV, uh, we mainly see two uh, peaks. And if we now uh, use the mass spec and deconvolute these uh, signals, then we can see that uh, some glycoforms elute early. So those are low affinity glycoforms and others elute late high affinity ones. The major difference is that those ones which are eluting late are, um, are lacking a few codes on one of the arms, whilst those eluting early with a low affinity have few causes on both arms. So this is very informative and we can look at minor differences in elution position. But here I just wanted to highlight two glycoforms. So this one here lacks a few codes down here while here this additional fucos is present and this makes the difference in affinity and for a factor of 50 which is indicated here by late elution of late elution of the high affinity variant okay so indeed fucosylation is the major factor if it's present it prohibits the interaction with the receptor reduces affinity by factor 50. okay this is was, was mainly uh, in a cancer setting and now Actually, these variants of glycosylation occur quite often in, uh, in nature, and we know for various viral diseases that we have variation in fucosylation, so antibodies being switched on or off. And when we got our hands on the first COVID-19 samples, we started looking at uh, the glycosylation of the antiviral antibodies. How do we do that? So it's a rather simple essay, I would say. Um, we take patient sera where antibodies are present. We uh, purify total IgG1 or total IgG from these sera uh, using pro-G beads. And we also purify the NTS antibodies by applying the antigen on, an, on, a, on a ELISA plate, absorbing, uh, absorbing the antibodies and then eluting with acid uh, the antibodies. Then we do a simple triptych digestion, digestion, no reduction alkylation, generating this nine amino acid peptide with the end glycosylation site. And here we have uh, then all the variants of, um, of these uh, glycopeptides with the different glycoforms on. And if you measure this eluting peak of uh, glycopeptides, because all the different glycoforms kind of co-elute, um, then we see that the total pattern is different from the specific one. So where is the difference? We see, for example, that this peak here, which is very low in the total uh, IgG, it is highly enriched in the NTS antiviral um, IgGs. And this one happens to like the, fu uh, the fucose. So indeed, we saw that uh, we have a, a pronounced profile of antibodies lacking core fucose on their CH2 domain. Um, and we, we have this for the NTS antibodies in COVID-19. Here's another example of a glycoform, which is low in the total, but quite uh, enriched in these NTS antibodies. 
Now, if we look at the precision of our method, uh, we are rather happy about that. So if we, uh, we do a relative quantification of the various glycoforms, both for total and for antigen specific, and we see that it's uh, stable over uh, our method is uh, performing over 10 months without a noticeable variation. Good. Now, we use this method to analyze samples which were obtained here at the hospital in Leiden, uh, patient samples from intensive care unit mainly, and we compared the total IgG glycosylation with the specific antibodies against DS. And what we observed is that starting point when patients came in, oftentimes that was uh, directly with intensive care unit stay, uh, we saw that many of these patients or some of these patients had low levels of fucosylation, so kind of inflammatory profile on their NTS antibodies. We also saw in terms of uh, bisection and other glycosylation feature that they differed from the total. We saw that galactosylation, the yellow circle, was increased on these specific antibodies and also silylation, another glycosylation feature, was different. So basically, they were vastly different in glycosylation uh, from the total IgG. And we were mainly interested in this low level of fucosylation as we knew that this would result in immune cell activation and potentially inflammation as indicated here. So immune cells with their 3A receptor and K cells or macrophages will bind to the virus via the antibody so the antibody engages via its FC portion with the receptor and via its FAP portion um, with the virus. Now, if we looked at how these antibody profiles were evolving with time, then we saw that within a few days only, um, and certainly in the co course of a week, we often or we consistently had a shift of the fucosylation. So early on when the antibodies showed up, um, when uh, the disease symptoms started, there appeared to be a very low level of fucosylation, and then within days, fucosylation was rising whilst disease was manifesting. So uh, here we have a color code, and these are the very sick um, time points or you know, patients. So when, this, when the disease was at, at its worst, the, the fucosylation was up again. So what we concluded was that the low level fucosylation, which is pro-inflammatory, is preceding the uh, massive inflammation. It's not a consequence clearly, but if at all, it could be a reason or a factor inducing the massive inflammation and the disease of the lung. We had a first paper where we contributed with our um, IgG glycosylation profiling. Um, so we measured from an Amsterdam cohort patient samples. And, um, and the idea is now that in the lung, we have these antibodies with a low fucosylation level before the disease really manifests itself or early on, let's say, when the first symptoms uh, show up and that these antibodies um, are activating immune cells such as macrophages in the lung and lead to inflammatory signals like interleukin-6 production. And this is actually what is shown here. If antibodies are produced, uh, anti-S protein antibodies, so uh, against uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, if we produce these antibodies lacking the fucose, that's indicated here and here, those are the ones which are good in in vitro assays in inducing interleukin-6 production, so in causing inflammation. Um, yeah. So that's our current ther theory that these antibodies may be causative for the inflammation. I mean, what we're also struggling with a bit is <clears throat> what is causing now this inflammatory profile early on. And actually, we, we don't really know. But what we see is there's a pattern of uh, viral infections like HIV infection, uh, CMV infection, but also SARS-CoV-2 infection where we see that a membranous um, and enveloped virus um, seems to present an antigen like the S antigen at the cell surface. And this seems to be uh, the context kind of an antigen in the membrane is this trigger which makes the immune system making uh, the low fucose uh, IgG antibody, um, which then can lead to inflammation. But we really lack a deeper understanding at the moment which factors would 
uh, specifically drive this low fuco simulation. So uh, coming back to what this does. So this is our current uh, simplified uh, simplistic view. Um, people get infected. Uh, the disease manifests itself mainly in the lung and we have there these uh, macrophages uh, with a three A receptor, which are then reacting to the virus via these uh, antibodies, which have low fucose. And then that leads to inflammatory cytokine production and uh, promotes uh, a bad disease course. Now, um, that was the part on, on uh, fucosylation, which uh, still has uh, comes with a lot of open questions. Now, what we also measured was galactosylation on these antibodies. And also here we saw vast, uh, vast dynamics. So these antibodies start with a very high level of galactosylation and then so show a very dramatic drop within days or weeks. And again, when the disease is, is peaking in terms of uh, severity, we see rather low levels of galactosylation. And, uh, and this also comes then with a massive cytokine uh, release, interleukin uh, 8 release. So frankly, I have to say we have a lot of data now and uh, we are not the only ones in the hospital having a lot of data. And we're now trying to link data in a systems medicine approach to make sense of it. Uh, we only got this massive data set a um, couple of days ago, and we are only starting now in doing a in-depth analysis. And with this, I uh, get to my uh, conclusions. So what we saw is a highly dynamic course of glycosylation of these NTS antibodies. And uh, we are now following this up uh, with many different time points, and we really want to understand uh, how this happens. And uh, I mean, antibodies tend to stay in the circulation. If they are not consumed, they stay for three weeks or so. So normally you have a very slow change of glycosylation. So the dynamics we see with changes within two days are really rather unexpected, and it's a novel phenomenon. Uh, we see this initial low level of fucosylation um, of these NTS antibodies. And uh, we think we have all indications that this uh, may cause inflammation. But of course, we don't really have data on the lung itself. So also, I'm a bit uh, reluctant to, to start working on, on uh, let's say, um, samples from the lung because, of course, they are highly contagious. And uh, whilst the blood samples we were dealing with until now were really safe, I would say. Um, and then we see the low galactosylation, which is also known for antibodies to be associated with the inflammation. And we also see in, uh, in this case a strong association with inflammation, disease severity, and cytokines. So we don't know how fucosylation and galactosylation changes work together. Maybe the fucosylation is an early inflammatory cause and the galactosylation may be a cause or a symptom of inflammation. And frankly, we don't know how these uh, patterns are caused. I mentioned that uh, it seems to be enveloped viruses which are causing this, but we don't know which signals of the envelope are co-stimulating this low fucosylation pattern or co-generating. Um, and then our question is, of course, do these uh, patterns influence or predict disease outcome? We had, we've, we've just uh, started looking into this now because now we have the power from more than 100 uh, patients uh, being analyzed to, to address these questions. And we are now also looking at, uh, into how uh, does this happen with, the, with the vaccination, so uh, different types of vaccination, which type of immune responses are you mounting? And does it matter whether you have a pre-existing uh, COVID uh, disease or um, in, in contrast to being naive? So all of these questions are now being addressed, but it will take some, while, some time. And um, how are we doing this? We do this in, under the lead of uh, clinicians here at the hospital, Anna Rauken, Sesame Arbus, and uh, Jutta de Vries. Uh, we have a big alliance in the hospital, the Deep COVID Alliance, <clears throat> where various immunologists are also contributing, and we are um, thrilled to have the chance of 
finally focusing on one type of disease. So I think that's a big uh, advantage of COVID that uh, instead of being um, spread out with different foci, we now have a joint focus. And we work with uh, surgical oncology, uh, but I think the I'm sure certainly the key people I want to acknowledge here are uh, Jan Nauta, our technician, Thomas uh, Ponkras, uh, who is maybe also on the call, Wen Jun Wang. So that's our core team here at the CPM working on antibody glycosylation in the context of COVID-19. We, I showed the data on the affinity chromatography by Stefan and his uh, supervisors. Um, we work a lot with Gesto Vidason Ellen and, uh, and uh, Mess from Sanquin, the blood bank in Amsterdam. So they have the uh, key research questions and also the, the knowledge on antibody glycosylation. Um, and it's a very fruitful, long standing collaboration. And uh, Roche uh, was involved in the affinity chromatography part together with uh, Stefan. This is a rather outdated photo, I have to admit. I mean, we didn't have a chance of getting a group photo uh, last year, as you may understand. And uh, this is our funding, and I want to thank you for your attention.